On this episode of Technically Leadership, Scott Roban joins me to discuss leveling up your team and organization and helping people acquire new skills or hone older ones. Scott owns his own consulting company after many years of leading in large-scale companies, and he co-founded the Network Automation Forum to help people grow their careers. He's also the host of one of the new podcasts on the Packet Pusher Network, Total Network Operations. We chat about handling disruption and change in our industry, acquiring new skills and leading by example, matching people and skills on new projects, and helping people discover what to explore, especially in this remote-focused world. Let's get to it. All right. And so as you've heard, Scott is joining me today. Uh, We're going to be talking a little bit about acquiring new skills and leading by example and all of those things. So Scott, I don't know if there's something maybe you want to start with here, but really when you and I had talked before, we talked about this idea of acquiring new skills and why that's important and why you need to get your team to acquire it and why it's so hard to get them to do that. So maybe there's something there you want to just kind of start with right off the bat. Sure. I, I, you know, fundamentally in any IT discipline or IT related discipline, we, we're kind of surrounded by change and disruption. There's mm-hmm. always something new every year, every couple of years. And part of, I think, whether we admit it individually or not, we've all had to roll with the changes, right? I won't I won't right. quote or sing any um, old 80s music lyrics there. <laughs> I promise. And so that's part of the gig, right? And if you want to survive and grow, in any IT-related career, you're going to have to be ready to take on new stuff um, as you grow. There are rare situations where you could sit and keep doing the same thing, but that's not going to last forever, right? That'll either get eliminated or, you know, maybe in a better case, get get put off to the side. Um, You have to be willing to be curious and to keep moving along with whatever the next thing is, whether it's networking or application development, you name it. Right. That makes sense. I mean, do you find, though, that people mostly get this as a leader? Like, you don't really have to explain that part to people usually, right? Usually. Yeah, I would say it's an 80 80 plus percent. People get it. Most folks that are engineers of any stripe are naturally curious. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to, okay, what's the the hot newness that I'm supposed to pick up? but there is that 20% that needed a little more encouragement, a little more motivation that, uh, yeah. you know, doesn't, doesn't always come as easy as you'd like it to. Right. That makes sense. Now, one of the things that I know I often hear is the, how do I continue to acquire new skills? Like I might get this from an engineer. How do I continue to acquire new skills if maybe my company isn't paying for me to go to a conference or they're not providing it right in front of me? So. As a leader, how do you encourage them to go out into the community maybe or to go find their own certs or things like that? How would you really approach that? So let me let me rewind and I'll just give some Mm -hmm. of my perspective. You know, I I come to this probably being pretty old school, where, you know, in the 90s into the aughts, you had to learn new stuff and you just had to put on, put in your own effort out of hours. Right. That's not necessarily the most equitable way for an employer (laughs) to treat things. Um, And as a leader, you know, whatever, regardless of your employer's policies, you need to find ways to let people carve out time to Mm -hmm. do stuff on the clock, you know, because it's it's to the employer's benefit, right? This isn't just for kicks, right? Um, I'm trying to remind me of your most recent question. Sorry, I went off a little (laughs) bit of a tangent No, it's okay. Uh, Yeah. You're you're going down the path that I was kind of getting to, which is this idea of a lot of times people currently come to a leader and they say, well, maybe the organization isn't paying for my travel right now. I can't go to the conference that I would have thought to go to. Right. How do you encourage them to maybe go out and explore a cert? Maybe they need to get that baby cert, those baby steps. Sure. Or perhaps they need to go out into the local community and start showing up at meetups and things like that. How are you encouraging that? as a leader in your organization, especially right now in this period of shrinking budgets and it's hard to just say, oh, I'm just going to send my entire team to KubeCon. That's not going to happen. 
So I would, so I would say from my starting position here in 2024, the time, yeah. the year of the recording of this podcast, <laughs> we live in the most information rich environment for learning new stuff that we have ever been in. Um, are there issues with signal to noise ratio? Sure. Absolutely. Um, sometimes there's a lot of noise to plow through to get to the signal, but for most tech fields, it's not that hard. So, so there's a lot of basic and more than basic education that any of us can do just by going to YouTube, just by using your favorite search mm -hmm. engine and starting. Right. And, and th that's not an excuse for lack of resources for more formal engagement. Right. Um, but at least there's a place to start. Um, and you can use tools like that if you need to build a business case for paying for a conference or paying for an online course, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, on the, you know, getting engaged in meetups and local gatherings, you know, I'll claim extreme bias here. I'm a co-founder right. of the Network Automation Forum where mm -hmm. we have just found this incredible um, unmet need for people interested in network automation to get together in person. And uh, over, you know, two events um, completed and one coming up in November 24, we haven't seen a lot of resistance or a lot of people saying, you know, I can't make it because I can't get my employer to pay for it. That's been really encouraging, right, to see yeah. that. And that's very narrow, right, with network automation. There's so much more, you know, other conferences that you've already right. mentioned here. I also happen to be affiliated with a group called the U.S. Networking User Association that mm -hmm. intentionally does local network user groups or NUGS, because that's just fun to say. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they usually meet three or four times a year, no cost to attend. So there are lots of, you know, interesting options out there. I think post-pandemic, there are more and more opportunities for people to get together in person for folks who are wired that way. You know, right. some people don't enjoy that. Some people don't like it. Um, but those opportunities for rubbing elbows with people that are doing the same things that you are, but also mm -hmm. doing them differently and uh, you can learn from. Events like these nugs and other, you know, DevOps days, things, et cetera, they're, they're engineered to let people get together and share ideas. And, and employers don't, uh, don't turn their nose up to free stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's easy to go to and if it's easy to do, they're like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go do that exactly. during working hours if there's some time. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to hear that you're saying that you're seeing more of that in-person meetups and user groups. Uh, I mean, I still remember Linux user groups. Uh, sure. is kind of where I was at one point. Um, mostly because I've actually found that Meetups are having more trouble meeting in person right now because they're having trouble getting people. Sometimes it's getting people to come, but also it's it's that signal to noise ratio, getting visible mm. and also having the same place to go meet because a lot of sure. companies aren't letting you stay in their office or something like that. Uh, so shameless plug to employers out there who are listening. If you can get some office space for your local meetups and are offering to share that, you're going to make some really good friends. Anyway, off, off of that topic, though, that's that's being good citizen, right? You know exactly. And and okay, would you rather have us come to you asking for a check to help pay for a brewery, um, right. which many many vendors do, and we're really super appreciative of it, right? Mm -hmm. But you can you know let people come in and use your first floor training center for a you know yes. an evening gathering or a Saturday gathering, you know, a few times a year, right? That, yeah. That's uh, that really helps the 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 broader community. Absolutely. So definitely uh, I am a multi-meetup host and conference host and all of those things, as you probably know by now. So you'll always hear me beating that drum. Uh, For sure. But kind of, so going back to the actual gaining of the skills and things like that, I know we talked with, we talked a little bit about originally when we started talking about this podcast was how you as a leader can also help drive it inside of your company by driving mm -hmm. people to host training content on a training portal, for example, right. or kind of leading by example to show what what could be done. So let's let's dig into that a little bit. How sure. how do you find 
it is to go to maybe your HR team, I guess, is the place to start. How, how do you get more content onto a training portal or access to LinkedIn learning or whatever it might be? How do you find is the best way to do that as a leader to kind of drive that conversation? So in my specific experience on this, and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll make it less cryptic. I spent about 18 years in my career at Juniper Networks. Mm-hmm. I moved through training, tech engineer, and systems engineering roles and SE leadership roles over time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was one of the places that impacted my technical and leadership formation more than any other single place I've worked for. And uh, it was largely a positive experience. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most disruptive things um, for me and many of my colleagues in the SE organization there, you know, being a traditional network engineering focused uh, company um, was seeing the emergence of cloud. Right. And this is probably like, duh, to most people listening to this right now. But if you think back 10 years and, you know, you have this group of people, highly skilled in a very particular thing, seeing it at a minimum um, added onto by cloud networking and other cloud services skills, and maybe even being supplanted by those new right. skills, hence, you know, that technical disruption. Um, yeah. We had with really good structure from our SE leadership at the time to um, do formal SE development, um, which is good. Like when you have those structures in place, even though budget isn't always easy to get, um, Mm -hmm. at least you've got a place to bring the issue. And then it's a conversation about what content should we include. Um, So one of the things that was clear to me on that front was, hey, we need to get more and more people cloud networking literate. Um, and this is before the advent of anything like the multi-cloud networking tools that are emerging today and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, and start with, you know, some of the low hanging fruit. Again, no no endorsement implied in any of these comments, but right. AWS, AWS was an easy decision, right? If you're gonna go mm-hmm. learn about your first cloud platform, um, why not start with one of the very obvious ones? And so myself and and some of my close colleagues were advocates for, well, let's get some basic AWS training um, into our internal portal. You know, this Mm -hmm. isn't comprehensive. We're not going to replicate the AWS certification program, but give give people awareness and give them a place to start. And from a leadership by example perspective, you know, in my role as, as the America's SEVP at the time, I basically started taking those initial courses and doing those certs so I could say with a straight face, hey, look, if I can do this, (laughs) any of you can do this. Um, I don't know how effective that was. You'll have to ask others. Um, (laughs) I'm naturally curious, so it wasn't a burden for me. Like I was really Mm -hmm. interested in in skilling up there anyway. Um, But I think that's a perfect example of leadership by example. Be, be willing to do it, be willing to put the time in. You know, you can make the argument that, well, you know, Scott, you're in a leadership role and you shouldn't be worried about fingers on keyboard. I I would strongly disagree in that case. You're leading a large technical team and showing that it can be done by someone with, yeah. you know, at your level, um, there's power in that. I'll, I'll pause there and see if that gives you any other questions. To yeah, pull no, it's... It's absolutely 100% accurate. The more you see, you know, somebody high up in a leadership structure doing it, it removes those excuses of, oh, well, I don't have time or I don't think this is valuable. Someone clearly does. Right. Someone out there does. Um, I guess, do you find in talking to other leaders that it's hard to get them to want that time on the keyboard? Because every manager I've talked to has always said, I miss some technical time to myself. Yeah. yeah. So do you find that's the case or do you <clears throat> find generally that managers kind of get to that point where they're just like, I'm done. I don't need any more technical experience. I think there are Curious. two two ends to that spectrum or at least two um, p- points that are, n- are not close together. Mm-hmm. One, one would be, you know, hey, I- I'm done. I don't need to do this anymore. Um, and I think in any kind of technical organization, 
that's uh, that's not a great sign, right? Yeah, People who want to be fair. a pure manager, um, I don't think that's good. And I know yeah. some good friends would disagree on that. Um, maybe the bigger company, this is how you scale an organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand those arguments a little bit. Um, but you need to understand, you know, what you're asking people to do and how you're trying to match people to tasks and projects. And mm -hmm. if you don't have a feel for the tech, how are you going to be able to make good decisions there? You know, that's right. So that's exactly. that's one extreme. The other ones who miss, you know, the technical time for myself, it's like you don't have to just miss it. You can yeah. again, we're a target rich environment. You can go, you can learn anything you want. You don't need an academic program. You don't need a formal program. But what you do need to watch out for is letting that technical curiosity get in the way of other people on your team growing and filling in right. those, those, those roles. And that's, I wrestled with that for, for quite some time. I do think I got better at it over time. Um, mm -hmm. The the stupider I became, it was easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you do have to if you if you're if you're wired as someone who wants to keep learning and keep adding skills, just don't let it get in the way of people on your team developing and filling in important roles that they need to be doing than that you as a leader shouldn't be doing. Right. Do you have any advice for somebody who's struggling with that since you've already been through it? Yeah, you have to learn to trust your your team. Mm -hmm. I mean, very explicitly, you can't do everything. You might want to. You might you might be an, an internal control freak and not manifest it well outside. Um, mm -hmm. And and I'm not speaking from experience here at all. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, you really you really have to. You, you have to learn to let people play the roles and let them grow. And, and that also means by failing, right? You're going to trust. Yeah. And that also means letting them stumble or, or screw something up and then, uh, you know, learn from it together. You know, what do you think? Right. What do you think happened here? Um, and I think moving, so my career moving to that second level manager, I became uh, the SE director of a, a large service provider account. And that, that was the transition for me that really forced me. I had to trust the other first line leaders more and the individual mm -hmm. contributors and, you know, people with the architect title, you know, above SEs and really mm -hmm. kind of see what that mix did together, you know, instead of me trying to be the person that uh, tried to answer everything all the time. Right. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Hmm. Um, speaking on a little bit on that, uh, the topic of managing a team and kind of learning to trust more and things like that. One thing about this, getting back to the acquiring new skills is we like to see our employees staying relevant so that they acquire the new skills, mainly because as new projects come in, you want to be able to match people to, for, with those skills to the projects. How do you find, is that typically a difficult thing to do to kind of say like, oh, I don't have that skill set on my team. Is it better to encourage them to go learn it before the project is coming because you have an idea that the project is coming down the pipeline or, or vice versa? Do you use this as the opportunity to say it's time to find more people for the team? I, my experience has been, uh, you know, it'll, it will be an imprecise number, but let's say 90% mm -hmm. of the time, it hasn't been hard finding someone who wants to skill up on something to um, just present the opportunities and let people gravitate to the things that they're interested in. And I, I know that might sound kind of crazy. If you're bringing the right kind of people on board, you'll, you'll already have a more than a bare minimum of that natural curiosity and people who want to learn the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it it can come in two categories at a minimum. You know, if you work for a vendor, hardware or software, you know, every quarter or every time interval, there's new features, right? right? So you, you've already got that cadence of, okay, I got to be ready with the next release or the next platform before it hits. But there's also the external stuff. You know, I'll use the example again of 
the rise of cloud computing and cloud services, you know, outside, you know, the current employer, you also need to, you know, it's, it's a different dynamic and getting access to info isn't always as easy, but right. uh, you have to be paying attention to both the internal things and the external things. I, I'm not a, I'm not a baseball or a sports ball guy, but uh, <laughs> I love the movie Moneyball. Right. Okay. And that whole, you can't replace person X with person Y exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to look at, do I have the right key skills in residence on the team? And, you know, I, I floated the number 90%. Okay. There's a 10% ish number where right. um, maybe I do need somebody new on the team who has expertise in that, or maybe I do need to pay for external training for someone mm -hmm. to go, you know, learn that new thing. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't found it to be that hard. Um, the, the cases where it is hard, you know, there's, uh, there's some persuasion, you know, <laughs> I wanted to say selling, yeah. but uh, that, well. that feels too slimy. Um, uh, you know, we, we know what you mean though. We know what yeah. you mean. There's a, Hey, here's why this is really useful you know, mm -hmm. for the team and for you. And, and I would say you always need to, people, people are basically selfish. And I don't mean that in a horribly negative way. People, right. people serve their own self-interests um, at the end of the day. And if you can find a connection to, here's why this will be helpful to you, you know, right. in, you know, in addition to this is why our organization needs it and so forth. Um, you can get to a you can get to a positive result through conversations like that. Yeah, I've I've heard you say the phrase specifically that no one cares about your career like you do. Yeah, that is one that yep. I know is kind of one of your slogans. I guess is the best way of putting it. Uh, so I imagine that's also another thing that you're appealing to is just reminding them that the organization is not here to level you up necessarily. It's here to level itself up and. Right. If you want to care about your career, you need to take the time to do it. Hmm. That, and that's really important in those, you know, if you're in a company that has an annual or maybe, you know, every six months development planning cycle, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's one key place where you say, Hey, look, this is where you, if, if I need you to create your own training plan, this is where you get to say what you want to do. Right. right. And, and don't be shy. You know, like I, like I told you last time, I enjoy the puzzle of trying to match what people want to do to what we need to be, mm -hmm. need to have done on the team. So. Yeah, absolutely. And on a previous episode of this podcast, we talked with a staff engineer who said that that was kind of the hallmark of making that leap to staff engineering is you are making your own professional plan. You're right. developing yourself on your own. So do you find generally that if somebody maybe is more junior, you have to guide a lot more on that development plan and encourage them to look ahead a little further, whereas the staff folks usually are really good about looking ahead far enough? Or do you find actually it it, it varies? No, I think I think it's a good generalization, right? There are always exceptions mm -hmm. to, to the rule. Um, I think about that whole progression, you know, from frontline to staff, um, to even distinguished engineer or even fellow, right? And mm -hmm. you see the individuals that rise to DE and fellow are the ones that have an area that they're very well versed in or a set of areas that they're very well versed in that they're actually trying to advance, mm -hmm. right? And not, not necessarily exclusively, but like, oh, they're known for, you know, developments in uh, MPLS traffic engineering, you know, or pick some other nerdy network area, <laughs> um, you know, speaking to things I'm, you know, are, are closer yeah. to home for me. Um, but they, their development looks different, right? Mm -hmm. Their, their development is a lot of time at IETF, right? And helping drive, you know, draft standards with other companies, other other service providers, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the younger side, yeah, I think you have to assume um, that people are going to need more guidance earlier in their careers, right. um, and maybe give them more opportunities or ideas to pick from. Um, you know, versus just expecting them to make it up. Right. right. Exactly. That makes sense. That so there's sense. one interesting thing on that front. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I've had conversations about this with other folks, you know, the, the impact of remote work on yeah. new and career people and not having the organic um, time with more senior people to see what they're doing and how they're evolving their careers and their roles. And, and that, you know, I don't want to call it quiet quitting because it's not what we're, yeah. we're hitting on here, but the, you know, hey, I just want to do my 40 hours, right? Um, there's some some sanity in that, right? And mm -hmm. maybe maybe this generation coming up is doing better at that than I did when I was new in career. Um, I suffered from wicked imposter syndrome and mm -hmm. said, well, I might not be smart enough, but at least I can put in the time 60, 70 hours a week. And uh, it's one of my biggest regrets in my career. I wish I, wish I had been home more with my kids when they were little. And I'll say that right. I said it before. So, um, so, so there's a balance to be struck there with, um, Hey, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't live to work, right. You work to live. Right. Um, but what does it mean to show initiative to show that you can independently pursue things without having to be prodded, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, be given really big carrots, you know, and that's, I think that's a new dynamic that a lot of first line managers really need to work with today. Right. That makes sense. I've, I've been remote since 2014, just for, for reference, so about 10 years. Sure. Yep. And I just realized how long that was. Okay. Laura's going to keep <laughs> on rolling with this one. Um, so I've been remote for a very long time and I have changed careers in that time frame a couple times actually to try something new. And so I've started at the bottom and had to build my way up. And I've generally found that I can maintain those 40 hours, but it is about making those spaces, having that conversation with your manager and doing that, saying like, hey, I need to learn how to do this. I need to learn how to do that. Maybe it's, and this is kind of me, I guess, editorializing a little bit here into the podcast, but sharing my experience of Part of it is understanding that I can find what those skills are, or I might need help finding what those skills are. But sure. once I know what I need to find, I just say like, hey, I need a couple hours today to do this. I need this. I need that. Being able to say what you need to be right. able to make that remote work happen, um, that remote leveling up. And then as, as more of a leader inside of an organization... And for for clarification, in 2020, when we all got locked down and everybody suddenly was remote, I was working at a company that the majority of the engineers had never been remote before and right. they didn't know what to do. Sure. And so we actually, I started up weekly meetings and weekly and a daily note of like, hey, here's your reminder on how to do this. Here's this idea. Here's that idea. Let's share Making those spaces, I think, as a leader is really important if you have a remote team. And it's not the, hey, let's have a water cooler Zoom call where yeah. we're going to sit there and stare at each other. No, that's right. boring. Don't do that. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, so it, it's it's funny that you, so I'm, I'm thinking about like different organizations and yeah. so in, in systems engineering, also known as sales engineering. I, I prefer systems engineering as a term. Yeah, that's um, fair. So there's a, one of the measures of your effectiveness is how much time you're spending with your customers, right? So there was okay. always that you're not expected to be in your cube in the office mm -hmm. um, all the time or even most of the time. So even pre-pandemic, there was this, you know, we, expo we expect people to be oot in a boot, you know, with their customers. Mm -hmm. um, and now, well, and even during that time, it it was really important for, I think, just about every SE to a person to have those times to get together, to be in the same place at the same time, you know, for the big events like SE training summits, you know, usually right. an annual event. Um, but even the smaller, you know, hey, be in the office one day a week or one day a month for the team to get together and so forth. Um, I would also say that in those SE roles, oftentimes you were dealing with people who were not brand new in career. So there right. was already a, for lack of a better way of putting an organizational maturity um, 
where you don't have to be as um, direct um, or deliberate about accommodating folks brand new to the role and brand new to the company. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, to your example, right, you already had a culture of people were already together in the office most of the time. And then yeah. <laughs> they were forced, forced apart. Um, so that's a harder transition, right? For sure. Yeah, it, it definitely took a lot out of people. But I think it might be interesting to look at that difference between maybe your engineers that are used to constantly pairing and constantly yeah. being able to turn around and tap somebody's shoulder and ask a question versus the, the SE world where, you know, you're alone. You're yeah. off on site with a customer and something comes up. What do you do? Right. You know, you can't turn around and go, hey, I need to grab you. Maybe right. you might be able to call somebody, but usually yeah. it's figure it out and then bring it back and have a discussion later about that skill that you were missing. Right. And I think that's that's a really interesting little takeaway to chew on for people who so, are doing the remote thing. Yeah, something something to think about. So Yeah. 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 Managers, how do you how do you keep letting people be remote? Because obviously we've seen how this conflict is working out right now among everyone yeah, about yep. in person, not in person. I'll be honest, for those of you listening, I'm sorry. I'm obviously the remote person in the room and I will always be the remote person in the room. So you're just going to have to deal with it. But it's an interesting question. How do you, how do you continue to maintain that? But what well, I would, what? there's a, there's a big piece of responsibility I put on leaders for this. Oh yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, it's basically knowing your team. Right. Um, if you, if you want to stay, you know, sanitized and, uh, not really engage with people as individuals, um, you'll, you'll, you'll get that level of engagement from them, which is not yeah. really good. Right. Yeah. Um, now I'm a, <laughs> I'm an introvert but I am a people person. I fake extroversion extremely well. Um, I know that feeling. <laughs> right. You know, um, and we can, we can psychoanalyze that on a future episode. How we, why are we like this? Exactly. Um, but I've always really enjoyed, okay, what makes, what makes Cindy tick? What makes James tick? I'm making up names. Yeah. And uh, what do they, what do they really like? What do they care about? you know, in the office and outside the office. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that takes effort as a leader. And oh, yeah. if you want, if you want to be a leader, that's part of the job, right? Be, yeah. Expect to have to engage and really, really know your team. Yeah. There's, um. so I'll be a hundred percent honest. I just pulled this off of my desk for, mm. since podcasting is a visual medium, you can exactly see what I'm holding up. Uh, <laughs> but there's a, there's a book called what type of leader are you? And um, people who have heard from me before probably know that I'm into the Enneagram in terms mm -hmm. of a discussion, like a, a point of conversation. Sure. But it talks about the, the Enneagram is something that talks about how we're wired, mm -hmm. why we're wired the way we are and how we like our initial reactions to things and what they might be. Um, but this book actually touches on that idea of what makes someone tick. And as a leader, what makes you tick? Yep. And how do you react to that? How do you drive it? And it yep. might be interesting to take a look at that as more of a motivator, kind of getting back to the topic of training. Like what what motivates somebody to go learn? Why do they want right. to go learn? And how do, do you they, tap into do that? Do they want to go learn? Yeah. Do they want to go learn? <laughs> right. Yeah. Are they are they willing to go do this on their own or are you going to have to motivate them? Because I think right. that's it is coming down to that in some cases, especially as we're remote. Where you do get the case where maybe you have to motivate somebody that you weren't expecting to have to motivate. I don't know if we really see that. Uh, like if, you, if you've experienced that. I know I've started to see that sometimes with more of the junior folks that I engage with. How do I motivate them to go learn? Which is hard. So. I, so I have a more extreme example of that that I've always oh gone back to. Yeah. Well, so I had a situation where. I had an individual who was in a role that he was just not fit for. Ah, okay. And, you know, after working through, hey, here, here are some things you really need to go dive into. This is something, and it was a set of technologies that were not native to the company, 
right? It took, mm. it was going to take extra effort. And, uh, you know, after running interference for some time and just not seeing any change, you know, there's the dreaded um, performance improvement plan in yeah. uh, sales organizations, the PIP. Being put on a PIP is never a good thing, right? right. Um, and so that, and that's a last resort, right? You shouldn't, shouldn't just jump to that. Um, right. But it went on long enough that uh, that's what needed to happen. And there's, there's two ways you can, cr you can craft a PIP. Um, you can make it impossible to be achieved and, and yeah. drive the outcome that you think you should be driving, which I think is the wrong way to do it. Right. Um, or you can craft it in a way that really reflects what's needed in the role and mm -hmm. have a, have a conversation around it where, you know, look, here's, here, here are the seven things that we need this individual to be able to do. Um, and, you know, here's where you're not matching up today. If you think we can come up with a way for you to, to engage in those areas that you're currently not, that's great. And um, this one individual came back to me after a conversation like that and basically said, no one ever took the time to explain this to me in the level of detail you just did. That's all, and it sounds oh, nice. horrible. Like I'm patting my own back here. Um, no, but I don't. It, yeah. People never get that opportunity if people assume they know what they're doing. Right. Right. No. And yeah, and this in, good. and this in, this individual went on to do something else. And I think he's been happier in his career um, mm -hmm. finding those other things than he would have been had he continued to try and bang his head against a wall, you know, on, yeah. on something that just wasn't a fit for him. So yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like it, trying to help people find that fit and showing them maybe like there's alternative training you could do. There's an right. alternative thing that maybe you could go try to learn that maybe that'll meet the the goal that you need to meet at the same time. I think those are good things because a yep. lot of people do end up in that situation where maybe no one's explained it to them before. Maybe no one's told them, this is why you need to go take that cert. This is why you need to have this knowledge or that knowledge, especially as somebody's more a junior, if they kind of are coming in in this age of title inflation, things like that, where some people maybe got a title that was appropriate in one organization, but is not appropriate in a larger organization or a different yep. organization. Yep. And they're struggling. And so how do you help them level up? Well, maybe you need to explain it to them. And I think that makes perfect sense. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. But I, th I think on that note, unfortunately, we are hitting time. So I, uh, you know, that I think is a good one to end this conversation on. I'm sure we will have another conversation again, but Absolutely. I want to say thank you for coming on with me for this conversation uh, on technically leadership. Thanks for having me. It's, this is a, uh, doesn't get enough attention and I'm really glad to see you getting this, this podcast yeah. series moving. I think it's going to be great. I'm excited. I'm, after, I'm, this I'm episode, after this after, episode, after this episode, after this episode, it's just going to be a rocket. Right. Exactly. Um, <laughs> all right. And I think on that topic, we are hitting time and I do want to get, give you the opportunity to kind of plug what's going on for you. So, um, let me ask you first, like, so what's, what's going on for you right now? What it kind of is the thing that you want everybody to know about? Well, make it a two-parter. There are two yeah, big things that take up do. my, uh, my bandwidth as a, as an independent consultant out here in the networking world. Um, the first is network automation forum. If you're interested in network automation and you want to see what people are doing in their own environments, um, please check us out at networkautomation.forum. Um, you you can find registration for our uh, conference coming up in November, 2024. And you can find all of our past content recorded on YouTube. You can get that all from networkautomation.forum. Please check us out. On the other hand, um, I'm starting a new podcast here on Packet Pushers called Yay. Total Network Operations. And uh, it's an honor to be part of the Packet Pushers galaxy of stars, as it were. And <laughs> uh yeah, it's, it's about all things network operations. I think it's an area that doesn't get enough attention. And as network technology doesn't churn as much and network architectures yeah. stabilize, looking at ops is a, a, a very fruitful place to say, how can we how can we do things better in the networking world? Right. So, so total network operations, check us out on Packet Pushers. 
hey, and by the way, this talent conversation, like development work, it perfectly tails with that. So you all should go check that out because it gives you a chance to go learn something new that maybe will keep you relevant as time goes on. But on that note, I want to say thank you so much, Scott, for joining me on this episode of Technically Leadership. We're really excited that you got a chance to come on. Thank you, Laura. It was great to be here. Thank you. And on that note, we'll just say bye for now. And hopefully we'll have you on again. Bye for now. Bye. Bye for now.